In this video, I want to talk about alloys. When you hear the word alloy, what do you think of? What is an alloy? An alloy is a mixture of two or more metals. So for instance, if we mix zinc with copper metal, we can get the alloy known as brass. Now zinc has a melting point of 420 degrees Celsius and copper is 1086. So what do you think the melting point of brass would be? It turns out that the melting point of brass is somewhere in between these two numbers. Let's say if we have a mixture of let's say 15% zinc, 85% copper. With this percentage, the melting point of brass will be somewhere around 900 to 950 in this range. Now notice that the melting point of brass is closer to the melting point of copper compared to the melting point of zinc. Why is that? The reason why that's happening is because this particular alloy is composed more of copper and less of zinc. Since it's predominantly made up of copper, the melting point of brass will be close to that of copper. Now sometimes you could have an alloy that has a melting point that's lower than the individual melting points of the two metals that composed it. And the only way to get this very low melting point is you got to get a certain ratio between the two metals that make it. But for the most part, if you have an alloy that is composed of predominantly one metal, and a small amount of the other, then the melting point of that alloy is very close to the melting point of the predominant metal, generally speaking. Now you need to be familiar with a substitutional alloy versus an interstitial alloy. Brass is a substitutional alloy. So let's say if we have a chunk of copper metal so every atom in this structure is composed of copper. Now let's add zinc metal to the mix. Now zinc is going to replace or substitute some of the copper atoms. And so that's why this particular alloy is known as a substitutional alloy. Zinc substitutes some of the copper atoms. So what exactly is an interstitial alloy? What do you think this is? And how is it different from a substitutional alloy? A good example of an interstitial alloy is the combination of iron metal with carbon. This creates steel. Now steel is still predominantly iron metal. Maybe about 99% of it is iron metal. And maybe 1% or less is carbon. And that makes steel. So let's say this is iron metal. and we're going to add some carbon atoms to it. So where will the carbon atoms go? That is the question. Now because this is not a substitutional alloy, the carbon atoms will not replace any of the iron atoms all of the iron atoms will remain in their locations. However, carbon, I put copper for some reason, but this is supposed to be carbon. Carbon is relatively small compared to copper. As a result, carbon can fill up the holes or the interstices within this iron metal structure. Now, not all of them will be filled, only some of them. 
So that is an example of an interstitial alloy. It's when you add basically a substance with small atoms to a metal that has larger atoms, and it could fit in these tiny spaces. And so that's an interstitial alloy. Now, I want to go back and correct something that I said earlier. In the beginning of this tutorial, I mentioned that an alloy is composed of two or more metals. And for the most part, if you mix two different metals, you will create an alloy. If you mix zinc and copper, that will produce the alloy known as brass. And you can make a lot of other alloys by mixing two different metals. This example illustrates that an alloy doesn't have to be made up of two different metals. Carbon is not a metal. In fact, the more technical definition of an alloy is a mixture of elements that produces a substance with metallic properties. So iron is a metal, carbon is a nonmetal, and yet combining these two we still get a substance that has metallic properties, still can conduct electricity as other metals. And so steel is an alloy. So I just want to adjust that definition of alloys. It doesn't have to be two or more metals, even though when you mix two or more metals together, it will produce an alloy. But an alloy can be made up of a metal and a nonmetal if that combined substance still has metallic properties. So just want to add that correction. Now there's some other alloys that you want to be familiar with. Let's say if we mix silver and copper, we can get something known as sterling silver. You've probably seen this in your kitchen. The silver spoon, the silver forks, it's composed of this alloy. And for the most part, it's predominantly silver. I believe the percentage is like 93% silver, or is it 92.5% silver? And 7.5% copper. It's somewhere in this vicinity, but for the most part, it's predominantly silver. Next, if you mix copper and tin, this will create bronze. And for the most part, it's predominantly copper with a small amount of tin. So these are some other alloys that you want to be familiar with. Another alloy that I want to talk about is solder. If you combine tin and lead, you can create the alloy known as solder. Now this is very useful if you want to attach a wire to a metal contact or a metal surface. You can literally melt the solder, which will hold the wire in place on a metal. Now the reason why I want to talk about this is because as I was researching this alloy on the internet, I came across a table that showed the different melting points of solder with varying percentages of tin and lead. So I'm going to put that here. Now the melting point of tin in Fahrenheit, not in degrees Celsius, is 449.5 degrees Fahrenheit. And the melting point of lead is 621.5 degrees Fahrenheit. So these numbers represent the relative percentage of tin and lead in a solder. And also we're going to talk about the melting point of that mixture. Now, due to limited space, I'm not going to put all the numbers, just some. So a 1090 mixture of tin and lead will produce a solder of with a melting point of 7, I mean 573 degrees Fahrenheit. A 2080 mixture will give us an alloy with a melting point of 533 Fahrenheit. 
and a 40-60 ratio will be 460 degrees Fahrenheit. 50-50, that's going to be 418. And 60-40 is 374. 80-20, 396. And 90-10, 421. So notice that when we have an alloy that is predominantly lead, the melting point of the alloy is very close to the actual melting point of pure lead, 573 compared to 621. And when we had a mixture that's predominantly tin, the melting point of the alloy is close to the melting point of tin. However, Notice that at some points, at particularly the 60-40 ratio, the melting point of the solder, the alloy, is less than the individual melting points of tin and lead. So sometimes somewhere in the middle, you can actually get a melting point that's lower than the melting points of the two metals that made the alloy. But whenever you have an alloy that is predominantly one metal as opposed to the other, then the melting point of that alloy will be close to the melting point of the predominant metal.